Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. As you can see, this time I'm looking at a PC Engine CD-ROM squared system. CD-ROM ROM. Um, so this is the interface unit. Now, I've got the uh, drive coming on the way. Uh, I'll show you that later in this video. Um, but in the meantime, um, I ordered the interface. Now, the, the drive has been donated uh, by one of my Patreon supporters, actually. Um, I'll talk about him a bit later when I show you that drive and I'll stick his name up here. Um, but this, um, I bought, let's say, separately in advance of the actual CD drive uh, coming. So it came in this uh, box, actually, all the way from Japan, so not a lot of bubble wrap. But it's in uh, good condition, it's not been damaged, and the sellers kindly put it inside a plastic bag there to protect it as well. Uh, so we'll just have a, a quick scan around the edges here. Uh, it looks okay, so we've got... Uh, Composite video, left right audio, uh, 9 volt DC. Uh, I'm not sure how the this powers the PC engine actually. Uh, we can have a look at that in a minute when we get the lid off. But actually, uh, you know, this was sold as um, in bad, you know, scratch condition kind of thing, scratched up. It looks absolutely immaculate to me. It really does. So we've got these two clips on the front here. So I'm guessing if we uh, just have to put the camera down, just push these uh, in, then I think the lid should come up. I'm not sure for my first time doing this, so bear with me. Yeah, so you just push those both in at the same time and then the lid lifts up. Uh, and as you can see, I was like this, these uh, <laughs> Japanese receipts. Quite cool, I'll keep that. Um, but the lid's, the lid's fine. There's not a mark on there. It's in perfect condition. Uh, and if you look at the uh, unit here, it's in remarkable condition. There's not a mark on it. I'm amazed at how uh, good that is. So that's how you eject it. You can see you pull that uh, lever and it's pushing these things here, which push the units forward. So I think I'll just uh, get my PC engine and connect that up. Because I'm guessing I should be able to at least use this without the CD and test the AV capabilities. Yeah, so we'll just slide the PC engine in here, uh, and it's just a case of uh, just pushing it in physically like that. That's it, that's in. Uh, so yeah, it looks quite nice. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is connect up uh, power and an AV cable and just give this a go. Um, I'm confused as to how this is powered actually. It must be powered by the expansion port on the back there, you know, the I.O. connector on the back of the unit. Um, because there's nothing to connect here, you know, there's nothing to mate with that. So yeah, power's provided through there, which is interesting. So there's the name of the chap who's uh, sent me this CD run to, uh, we'll have a quick look. And I'll put a link to his uh, YouTube channel in the description below. Um, I think he's working on a video at the moment, he's not got very many videos up there, but they're, uh, they're very cool, the ones he does have. Um, I think there's one on a virtual boy you should check out. Um, that was pretty cool. But yeah, as you can see, it's sweet. It's in excellent condition. I mean, it's a bit dirty here, but this will clean up quite nicely, I think. And if you compare to the fairly clean PC engine, this is the one that's not quite as clean as the two, because I've got two of these. It, if I just put this in some vanish for a bit longer, it'll come out even whiter. But as you can see, that's not too bad. And the colour is not dissimilar, it's not really yellowed, you know, some of these go uh, really, really yellow and you would need to retro bright them, but uh, yeah, this one looks fine. Um, the interesting thing with these, um, they're kind of standalone in the sense you don't actually need to connect this up via the interface unit here. You can just literally put power, you've got line out, uh, and then you can just use it as a standalone audio um, drive, you know, for playing audio discs, so that's quite cool. We'll perhaps try that first, just to see what it's doing. Uh, so if we just go around, we've got a little um, LED, uh, you know, seven segment display there to show you which track number you're on. You've got a repeat button, presumably that little LED lights there to indicate you've clicked that and it's in repeat mode. Uh, and then you've got uh, next, you know, previous track, next track, play, pause, stop, uh, headphones, uh, jack there, volume, slider on the front, or wheel I should say, um, and then just uh, as previously seen a minute ago there, the CD-ROM out connection that goes to the interface unit, um, power in and line out. So a quick comparison uh, of the uh, DC power jack requirements there, you can see DC 9 volts uh, negative is the centre there uh, for the actual PC engine itself, and it's the same 
exact same thing on here so you can see this center negative 9 volts and the PC engine power supply will fit in there so that's quite nice we can just power that separately using the standard power supply I've been using to give that a go and you may be wondering why have a CD-ROM and a separate interface why not combine the interface with this you know and just have this something you know, attached to the back of the PC engine somehow um, now I can't remember the specifics but it was something to do with the product uh, category or you know, classification that I think with the interface built in it was perhaps classed as like a multimedia system or something like that and they were trying to avoid that um, so separating the interface from the CD part avoided some like I said, product classification thing there in Japan which meant maybe there were less taxes and things to pay um, I think that's the, the top and bottom of it so we'll connect our power up uh, let's just see what happens I don't know whether this a power switch, I don't remember seeing a power switch anywhere on this. Okay, well straight away that's a good sign. We've got uh, the LED illuminating there. I don't think we're going to be able to fool the lid. Oh no we can. Can you see here, there's the catch for the, uh, the switch inside there. So what we can do now is just see what's going on with the... Um, the, the laser here, will it focus? Um, you know, it should bob up and down as it tries to focus on the disc. So I'm just going to find something small to just push into there to care carefully. Might be able to do a finger, no. Uh, push the little switch down, and then we should see some activity. So just pressing that across there doesn't seem to be doing anything at all, even when you press play. So it's possible there's something else wrong with this. It's possible that switch is not working. It's also possible there's some other switch, and maybe that's got nothing to do with... Maybe it's not a switch, but it's just a catch. I don't know. It does look... You can see this is angled here, this uh, this little flap, which suggests that it slides down it and pushes it across slightly. Um, but you would expect the laser to start bobbing up and down if, uh, you know, that was uh, enabling the discs, you know... Uh, disc detection there you know to show you actually closed the lid don't hear any noise there so let's get a disc so we've got a disc there let's just shut it and just see if we can get any activity out of it at all nope it's not looking promising is it nothing nada so I mean this may be beyond repair it may be a case of uh, someone's tried to look at this in the past and you know not been able to fix it they may have done further damage to it we don't really know um, so I think I'll take this apart I think before we do anything else so to get inside this it just looks like uh, the four screws on the underside there we might need to undo one or two of these but I don't I doubt it I think they're just for the lid and stuff like that um, Possibly one or two of these, I'm not sure yet. But we'll get those four out and just see where that uh, takes us. So, four screws removed, and we can see the board. That's nice. So, straight away we've got there what looks like a, a RAM chip. Uh, what's this over here? A little Sony. Sony IC. Is that a DAC or something there? Quite possibly. LC7881M. Uh, could be an op amp or something. We'll get the board out, I think. Uh, how easy? Yeah, it's just there's a screw there. I was going to say, he, how easy is this to get apart? Yeah, so we've got that screw out. Is that the only screw holding the board? Yeah, it is. This new seems that you can move it. Yeah, so we've got a little flex ribbon there. There's going to be a few of those. We've got one at the front here, you can see. And that's for the laser. Um, and then there's a few connectors back there, but those look like they, those could stay connected, and you could perhaps then just flip it over. So let's just carefully undo these these two first. So the way to do this is just to pull those like that, and then this little uh, flex ribbon, if you're just careful with it, should uh, I think pull out of there like that. That's it. Uh, so it's probably going to be a similar story over here. Sure, we're not going to pull anything. 
yeah, you've got a wire, you, know, you can see that, that black wire there, down there, it's just kind of trapped. So I should be careful, because we'll end up uh, pulling that off if we're not careful. Just pull out the little cavity, there we go. So I've had a bit of an inspection of the board, I can't see uh, any obvious problems, but I thought what we'd try and do is just move the carriage here by rotating these gears, but it seems to be completely jammed, I think that might be the problem, we might have uh, a jam here, now it could be because the tooth's missing from the centre gear, can you see it's yellowed there, I'll zoom in uh, on that in a minute, that's quite common for those to uh, break. Uh, but I'm surprised, should, yeah it should be able to, there you go it's moving now, it was stuck, I think the gear's okay because I'm not feeling any crunching or anything, but maybe that was all that was wrong with it, maybe it just jammed up, I don't know, so we'll move that across a distance and then I'll just quickly reassemble it, power it back up and just see what happens, um, the interesting thing here you can see it's upside down but it's a Sony KSS220A, the optical pickup uh, unit on this. So I'll like to say, I'll connect those two ribbons, put it back together, and just give it another try. So it's still doing the same. I've zoomed you in, and I'm just going to trick the switch uh, down there, just thinking the lid is down. And if I click play, we'll see if we can uh, see any signs of activity. I'm sure a minute ago I thought I saw some laser activity. Let's just try that again. I mean, it wasn't moving, it wasn't bobbing up and down, but I could actually see. You've got to be careful not to look at it straight on, obviously. I'm not sure if what's happening here is the laser's faulty. You know, that it could be the coils, you know, the focus coils on there. That's a possibility. So before I do anything else, I'm going to uh, grease this uh, the bar here, the gears. So I've got some of this uh, Mollicott uh, stuff. I think it was 12 volts vid. Uh, I first saw this on his channel. He uses it in a lot of VCRs and things. So I'll just get some of this. Um, we'll distribute it on the rail there. So it's very interesting. This there's no signs of life at all. You know, so the the motor doesn't spin. The focus doesn't bob up and down. It doesn't seek back to uh, you know track zero if you like because there's a little switch can you see switch there when that switch is pressed it's uh, you know the logic on the drive PCB here knows that it's uh, track zero uh, and typically when you switch one uh, you know a CD ROM drive on the first thing it tends to do it's quite common for the uh, assembly head assembly there to seek back to track zero uh, sometimes you get a focus first before it does that to detect there's a disc that might be the case in this scenario um, so as you can see for the moment I've just disconnected the uh, the laser because that's all that's feeding here if you look at this little ribbon it, it comes to the laser assembly here the optical pickup uh, and then the other one down here I think is the actual pickup part down here you know so that's the laser that's the pickup I think strange having two different connections but that seems to be how it's wired and if you look at the motor uh, I need to check the solder points on there make sure that's okay but there's no reason to suggest that the connections would have come off the wires there but they come across here uh, I think blue and pink straight to the board down here and I think this is where these uh, H-Bridge you know BTL drivers are going to come into play we could have uh, a fault with one of those there could be something else wrong with the logic on here that's driving those uh, it could even be a ram fault or something now you get the same exact same behavior if i click play here uh is it connected up i'm not sure now yeah so if you connect the power up you can see you can get uh, the same behavior where you get the zero coming up there uh, so it's just a good way to be able to press play get the zero on the display and then have a measure around. Now I measured some of the test points on the underside of the board there's one that's marked 2.5 volts that's like a reference voltage that's there that's okay um, but at this stage yeah I can feel that's really hot that's actually super hot I suspect it's trying to drive that motor and it's not able to for one reason or another. Now I did just grease up with the molly coat there 
uh, and that did make a difference. But that's actually quite warm considering it's not actually driving anything. So that makes me think we've got a seized motor or one of these uh, is faulty. So the next thing I'm going to do is disconnect uh, that little middle gear actually just to isolate the motor to see if we can get the motor to rotate uh, powered by the H-bridge driver because that gets very warm uh, sorry you can't quite see this that gets very very warm it's still hot now just after maybe 10 seconds of being on it gets hotter and hotter and hotter uh, eventually the LED thing goes off as if like it's gone into some sort of shutdown then you've got to disconnect the power plug the power back in and uh, that shouldn't be happening, that should not be getting hot so soon after power on with no physical movement. You know, you could understand if the motors were going around and things, yeah, you might get some heat on there. But the fact that they're not moving suggests we've got a, a, a jammed motor or a shorted motor or something wrong with that BTL driver, I think. I think that's what the issue is with this. Um, so, like I say, I'm going to take off the middle gear. There's a little split ring, you know, a circlip. Uh, on there so we'll get that get that off and then the gear should slide off which then means this motor shouldn't have any resistance from the carriage so it'd be interesting to see if at that point do we get any activity on that motor so I think mission accomplished in terms of a diagnosis I'll just press play and just listen can you hear that gears going round you hear that so we do have uh, and that's not warm now, that's not getting warm. We did have a jammed carriage, and despite being greased up here, there's still a load of resistance. Now, I'm not really sure how best to uh, to deal with that, actually. Let's just see how free... Oh, that moves super easy now. That moves super easy. So, the resistance, it would seem, is actually caused by this gear. Now, I do have a replacement. Um, there's no teeth missing off that, I don't think you can see, it's in super good condition. So I think what I'm going to do is take this out, put the new one in, and grease up the gears, because that's what they haven't done, is get some, some grease on the actual gears. And we'll just see if that solves the, that particular issue. As I say, we may have a secondary fault here. The laser might be faulty. The H-bridge driver could be damaged by as a result of what's going on here. Now, you would think not, because it's actually rotating now, and you've got a number of channels usually on these, you know, they provide two or four different uh, outputs. Uh, you know, one will be for, I think typically with these, they're going to be useful. One will be used for the tracking coils, you know, your track -out, tracking servos, your focus servos will be another, yeah, uh, you know, uh, up and down, what you would call that, optical pickup seek, you know, the track seek, and then one for the motor typically so you'll probably have two in each one of these that's probably why we've got two of those um, but it's like say you could have some damage elsewhere we might have a digital fault or whatever but I think it's unlikely I think uh, we'll swap that gear out and let's just see what happens so I'll post links in the video description below you can get this from the uh, Hong Kong uh, video game doctor I think it's called uh, so yeah, that looks like an identical replacement for me, but it's obviously nice and white. It's interesting how the uh, plastic goes yellow like that, and they go brittle, which is why you can get these as a spare. Because typically with these, the middle gear here, the teeth will shatter off because of it's got you know because it's it's gone yellow, it's gone brittle with age. It's strange how the other two gears don't do that. They're made from a different plastic probably, or maybe this has got bromine or whatever it is you know in there to. Uh, make it fire retardant but it'd be very strange to make a gear <laughs> fire retardant but uh, yeah and it comes with it you can get it with a washer or without the washer so i've got a new washer but i'm just going to stick the old one on for now so loosely reassembled i've not got any grease on the gears yet i'll do that in a sec but we did just see a minute ago there that the motor was actually moving that's the old one the washer that washer will cause you no end of trouble getting it on and off it's very difficult be very careful what i did is i put it on a little flat tool like this you know put the washer on there tilted the unit so that i could keep the screwdriver pretty flat so that i could then just very carefully eat, hold it across the, the center point there where it needs to go back on and then at the same time use uh, another screwdriver just to try and push it on if you're not careful it'll flick off and you will lose it never to be seen again so be super careful with that washer but I suspect this is going to work. Let's switch it on. Look, activity straight away. Uh, obviously, it's noisy. I need to do some work there to solve that. I'm not sure where that clicking noise is coming from. You know, the scratching noise, or whatever it is. Let's just try and seek up. 
and that's working. I'll get some headphones on in a sec. Fantastic. So, yeah, you wouldn't uh, believe it. I, I certainly didn't. When I first went inside this and saw how it was behaving, I thought, oh, God, we've got a logic fault or a faulty uh, BTL driver or something. Uh, and if it was a logic fault, you know, you've seen the, the quad flat packs on there. It can be very difficult to diagnose unless you're an absolute expert in that area. Someone like Retro Game Mods could perhaps stand a, a better chance than I would have done. But, you know, if there's something wrong with, like, uh, the chip that... Uh, processes the RF signal and stuff there and some of the other stuff you know the, the, this, there will be an MCU uh, you, re, you know you, you really need full data you know data sheet for those chips and things in order to uh, diagnose faults there but it is uncommon for those types of chips to fail but it does happen you know that's the thing it does happen and I thought that was going to be the case with this but yeah so you get one of these swap that gear out regardless even if the teeth are all okay and, uh, yeah, I would swap that out. So let's just uh, quickly connect some headphones. Like I say, I will get some uh, lubricant on there in a minute and just work out what that, uh, that noise is. Some rubbing. It could just be because it's not screwed together properly. It really could be that simple. But I'm just curious to hear if we get any uh, sound out of this. Uh, let me just put that on. Yeah, you can hear that. It's pretty distorted because it's so loud. Yeah, that's working fine. This is making a ticking noise, but perfect. Well, just did not expect that at all. So all I need to do now is get a bit more lubrication wherever it's required, um, and then just carefully uh, reassemble, I think. So I thought it would be worth, while I'm here, just showing you these pots. Um, if you ever get one of these, because I think I had someone asking me recently on my channel, what at what position to put these in as default, you know, uh, and they are going to vary, as I've mentioned in the previous videos, they're going to vary from drive to drive, but typically they'll be in approximately the same position from factory, uh, as long as it's the same model. So, you know, you can see roughly uh, the orientation of those there, which way they're pointing. So if you get one of these and someone's pissed around with those and set them in wildly inaccurate uh, values, you may get nothing at all, and it could throw you into thinking... Uh, you know, you've got a faulty laser. So I would start by just having a quick look at the pots uh, on one of these. Just make sure they're in approximately the same position. And uh, another technique, you know, I've shown it before in other videos, just draw a little line across them before you adjust any of them, regardless of the situation, uh, so that you can at least set yours back to how it was. And the better way to do it is to, you know, and again, I've talked about this a million times before, just measure the resistances, you know, from the, the centre, you know, the common pin there, to either side and write them down and do that for each one before uh, and after you've adjusted them uh, just for reference but obviously the best way to adjust one of these is going to be with a scope uh, you can see on the board here you've got uh, some nice little test points marked so this is where I the ones down here this is where I measured the voltage before I didn't show it but I measured from the ground on this pad uh, this area over here, I couldn't really see ground anywhere, you know, there's nothing obvious in terms of a ground. So I went from the ground over here and just measured to that 2.5 volts there, which I think is some sort of voltage reference or something. Uh, and there was 2.5 volts. So that kind of, that was one of the first things I did. It gave me a high level of confidence that, it, you know, the voltages were probably okay. I mean, we saw the little LED display come on right at the start there, the seven segment. That would have been a clue. If that didn't come on, yeah, we we're probably looking at a power issue. There is, on the other side, uh, I'll just show you briefly, uh, a 7805. Uh, sorry, should move you into shot a bit. Should be doing, obviously, this on the ESD mark, really, but it's, it's okay. It's a piece of paper. There's hardly going to be any static generated on here. Uh, yeah, 7805. So, you know, you could measure the 5 volts there, but generally, like I say, the LED on the front is your clue. If you're getting illumination there, your voltage is going to be okay. Uh, these sort of caps don't typically need replacing, but from time to time they can. I've heard of on the American versions of this, uh, on the TurboGrafx CD, sometimes you can get shorts. One or two of these can fail and you can get a short across your supply rails and things. So, you know, you could you could replace these, but I wouldn't do it as a preventative thing. I'll bet you anything, you know, a unit like this, another 10, 20 years from now, could still be running the caps, wouldn't be an issue. It really is one of those things to do with brand and how they're actually used and stuff and uh, the batch. But these, they're all right, these. Um, it is very rare to need to swap a cap out on one of these. Uh, what, so what else have we got? Well, like I say, uh, a bit earlier on when I was waffling, there will be an MCU. Uh, 
there's a couple of ram chips can you see that there Saudi uh, I'll zoom in a little bit just so you can get a closer look at some of these but it's probably going to blur just a tiny bit that's not too bad yeah so you can see that's a Sony uh, CXK5864 is it BM-12 so yeah that's going to be an SRAM there was a couple of different SRAMs on the underside I think uh, at least one I think it was the one I pointed out right at the start we can have a look at that in a sec uh, and then you've got these three ASICs here that's probably the RF chip there just based on some of the set the chipset here I've seen on other Sony drives you get this tiny little square quad flat pack and more often than not it's uh, it's usually something to do with the RF processing um, and then let's say one of these is going to be an MCU I'm guessing that because that the pin density is very high there I suspect that's going to be the MCU on this and it's interesting you can see a little uh, sorry just off camera just a little bit there uh, a resonator you know uh, for, you know, it's like a crystal effectively and you've got a crystal resonator up there for that one as well so both of those chips uh, have got one of those so I mean that could be like an MCU um, I've got no idea uh, and there'll be different reasons for the you know have two different clocks there in fact there's three different clocks there's a crystal up the front here you can't quite see it sorry I'm having one of these days today I don't feel well and uh, I'm just uh, not filming <laughs> things and talking about things you can't see uh, so I mean there's not a lot else to say really about this let's say other than you know always swap out your gear even if it looks okay well assuming your carriage is jammed like mine was uh, and then grease up the rails and things so I'll get some more of that at Mollicott onto both rails uh, and I just reassemble it I think and then we'll just clean the outside and then give it a test so you can just sit the board at the side of it like that, it will reach if you're careful. You've just got to watch out for these ground wires. You can see one of them here is soldered to at the exposed part of the flex ribbon. It looks a bit weird if you look at that. I was thinking, oh god, someone modified this or something and soldered a wire onto the flex ribbon. But no, it's you know, it's it's got a dedicated uh, shield point on there. Uh, this stuff, you don't need very much of it at all, just a tiny little bit like that. And then just uh, distribute it on the rail a little bit like this. And then perhaps use the dry end afterwards just to clean off any of the, I don't know you can see we've got a little bit on the chassis below there, just cleaning the excess off so you've not got it all over the, the place and stuff. Uh, I'll perhaps get a bit more for that rail. Uh, and the same over here, just be careful uh, not to get it absolutely all over the place. Uh, and bear in mind, once the uh, carriage has moved up and down a few times, that will distribute it. Uh, Let's get some of that off there because I've got it all over the place now. That's not too bad. Uh, I think what it might do is just what, freewheel. You can see actually it's moving super easy now. Before there was a lot of resistance. That's super easy. You can see how, how well that's moving. I'm not feeling any resistance on my finger before it was uh, quite stiff there. So uh, you can see you can do a bit of this here. Just move that rail around just to. Uh, sorry, the cotton bud just to distribute it, uh, and it'll get some oil off there because there's some old stuff stuck at the front there as well. Just get a bit of that excess off there. Yeah, that's not too bad. Uh, reconnect it. Obviously, it's just the reverse of what we did to start with. Just make sure the uh, housing slid down as far as you can get it, and then stick this in first and you've got to try and do it as straight as you possibly can because it needs to go in straight you can feel that's it, it's pushed in uh, and as soon as it's in as low as it'll go and slide that up, just make sure it looks straight and it, it, it is uh, and then it's the same thing with this side, just turn it around a little bit uh, you need to try and pull this bit out, this is the fiddly one because it's just a really awkward shape, uh, and just push it, there you go yeah that's it, it felt like it's stuck, it feels like it sticks in, you know, it's like two levels, you know, you push it in start, it doesn't do anything, and then you just push it that little bit further and suddenly it goes a few more millimetres in, uh, and then just slide the housing down there, that's it, and then just be, when you put this back in here, just be super careful to not ca catch that ribbon, it should go down the right hand side there, like that, um, and then on this side here, just watch this, this I need to do two black wires because there are two uh, just make sure they go right back in and don't obscure the connector or anything there and then I think there was one screw holding uh, holding this in here somewhere uh, and then we can just put the, uh, the bottom back on 
And as we put the bottom back on, uh, I can clarify that is a DAC, that's your audio DAC, uh, and that is definitely another SRAM. Uh, no idea what that little Sony chip is down there, but it's right next to uh, these uh, ribbons here for the laser, so it's going to be something to do with the focus or tracking, I, I suspect. So a quick test here, can you hear the noise? I think it's the spindle thing on top, because if you move it, can you see? It's gone. Let's back again. It works okay, there's no interference or anything like that, it's just a noise. So I suspect the easiest way to solve that is going to be to unscrew these, oh sorry, disc flying out, uh, pill Madonna, uh, unscrew these three, screw, three screws here uh, and get a bit of that uh, mollycott on the inside of the plastic bit where it rubs so that as it rotates it should be super quiet so I think we'll do that next so I got the three screws out there that was super easy actually take that off so you can see can you see this here can you see how the paints chipped off it that rubs on the uh, inside of here so the smallest bit of uh, mollycott around there that should solve that so I've got a bit of grease on there and in fact, too much uh, is probably not the end of the world actually with this here. Uh, just to make sure that it is fairly well lubricated. There's nothing worse than a drive making an annoying noise like that was. I thought I'd just show you, if I just power this up now, just watch the laser here, you should be able to see it bob up and down. Uh, and this was something we, that wasn't happening before, just watch. Press play. See it? And I can actually see it. You might be able to see it through the viewfinder. I'm not sure. Press play again. See it? Bob and down there. And it's super silent now. Uh, if I put a disc in. Uh, I don't know what it's going to do with that. Oh, it's spinning. But can you hear? There's no noise at all. The seeks are silent. The spinning silent. It's superb. And you can see I just lightly wiped the front here. It's my IPA and the dirt's come off. Uh, I will get the soap and water on this in a minute before I show you the final result just to get all the dirt out of these little embossed, you know, uh, bits. But I think it's time to connect it up. I think there's two switches there. Um, it might be ground contacts. Yeah, the ground contacts. Can you see? I thought they were switches. They may be switches. They may be dual purpose. They may be switches, but also uh, makes a ground connection there. It's probably just ground, to be fair. Uh, and you just push it in. And then on the front here, you see this at the bottom, you've got this little flap, and there's a little bit on there to grab it. Uh, and you just lift it up and slide it across. Um, and then you use your, you know, the power switch there to switch the system off and on. So once your power's connected there, this illuminates straight away, but uh, the system's not actually on. It only, only comes on when you switch it on the front there, like that. And I've got the EverDrive in here for the moment because I've not got a system card. You know, you need, at the very least, system card one. Uh, to be able to boot some of the older games and then you've got system card 2, 2.1, 3 and an arcade card for all the different sort of flavours of uh, you know uh, tiers of games you can get there for the uh, PC engine but the EverDrive is a good way to get access to system card 1 and system card 2 you can't run system card 3, well you can but it doesn't provide the RAM, there's no additional RAM provided by the EverDrive and system card 3 has additional RAM built in and if you have a Duo or a Super CD-ROM 2, like the couple I've repaired previously, uh, you know, one of them which I've kept for myself, you've uh, got a system card rebuilt built in as well as that additional RAM. Um, and the arcade card has even more RAM over the Super, uh, you know, the system card, you know, the one you get in the Super system and the uh, Duo. Super CD-ROM System 1, let's go for version 2.10, we may as well. Um, and I've got Wonderboy in here at the moment. Uh, let's hit run and let's see what happens. Sweet, I think that's working. Yeah, that's, that's loaded really quick actually, which is surprising because these are single speed CD ROM drives. But yeah, I would call that a success actually. Uh, again, thanks again for Dennis for sending this to me. Um, it's really sweet, it really is, it's in awesome condition. It's pretty much good as new, it will be when I finish cleaning it in a minute. Um, I think the CD, uh, the original CD-ROM, you know this one, with the interface unit, it's really sought after. Um, and there's multiple reasons for that, you know, if something goes wrong with your CD part, you don't need to 
send your whole system away, etc. You can just send the CD part away. Um, but also it looks quite cool, you know, the whole thing about it being a little briefcase. I'll show you in a minute with the cover and stuff after I've cleaned up the, the interface unit and the cover as well. They just look really cool. Um, something nostalgic, I think, about the original CD system there. Um, and as I said, you can play all the games on this, you just need the right system card. That's the thing. I'll probably get a system card for free. I don't think I'm going to invest in a, an arcade card for this, just for those few games, because I've got access to those via the Super SD System 3 anyway from the Terra Onion team. And I've also got a Super SD CD ROM myself here, you know. Not, not Super SD, yeah, Super CD ROM 2. That's what I meant to say. Sorry, I'm just not feeling with it at the moment. Um, so I can play all the games I want to already, but for this one it'd be useful to get uh, System Card 3, I think, just because there are quite a lot of games um, for the Super, you know, tier. Yeah, playing very badly. But uh, anyway, well, that's, that's working super well, I think. So, yeah, mission accomplished. Sweet. It's quite good load times actually on this as well. So I can tell the laser's pretty good on this unit. Hard game this, seriously hard. So I figure a quick uh, look at the RF level would be useful here actually. So we've got one division there, as you can see, uh, representing 200 millivolts. So I'll just connect this up carefully, uh, you're not going to be able to see me doing this, but it's... I'll just check it's playing a disc. Yeah it is, I'll just move to the next track. Yeah, so I'm playing an audio uh, CD here at the moment, a pressed one. And if I just connect between ground, I have to try and hold this on there, and the RF pad there, just let that stabilise. You can see we've got one, two, three, four, about four and three quarters maybe, maybe four and a half because it's bobbing around a bit. But yeah, I'll put uh, an annotation up when I've calculated that correctly in a minute. But you can see, you know, that's the RF level you're looking for. Um, when you're adjusting the laser on one of these, if you get one of these and, and that's not what you're seeing on your scope, um, you may need a new laser, it may just need some adjustment. So there isn't actually much required to clean this, just a bit of uh, water there with some soap mixed in. Uh, and then what we'll do is, I'll perhaps just get a tiny little bit of soap like that around these parts, uh, just use the brush around there. See that? That's come out super well actually. It's got rid of all the, the dirt that was in the little crevices there. Uh, and that's all it needs. Uh, some systems need a lot more than others, but these are super easy to clean actually. Uh, so I'll probably just do the same thing there, just get a tiny little bit of water just on that area, and then just do a bit of this. And we'll just use a bit of uh, Meguiar's plastics here uh, to clean up just a few bits that are scratched. You can see like there's a little scratch there. Um, be careful what you know on the print and stuff on here. If you get any on that window there, I'd be careful to avoid uh, the uh, logos and things because you may well remove uh, the prints. But you can see that marks come off just from a little bit of uh, polish there. You see that? That's gone. Uh, there's another one here. Can you see that? So it'll be the same thing there. Just get a little bit of this on there that should hopefully. There we go, it's gone. See, so the IPA wasn't cutting it with those, but a tiny little bit of this, and uh, yeah, it's gone. Yeah, the front could do with a little bit. There's just a few little light scratches there, so we'll get a little bit on there as well, I think. Yeah, not looking too bad at all. Yeah, I think you'll agree that looks uh, 
almost good as new actually we've got an X there where someone's marked it as faulty um, so we'll get a bit of IPA and clean that off yeah so with a bit of IPA there and a bit of pressure you can see that little mark there that's uh, been put on there to indicate that this is a faulty unit it's coming off pretty easily actually I'll try and steer clear of the seal number there I don't want to affect that but we can get that off I'm tempted to stick, uh, stick something under there actually just to say that this is uh, working I might do that in a sec so yeah it was a bit persistent that but it's come off so again just a couple of little scratches and marks and things there we'll clean those off Probably a good idea while we're here as well just to clean up uh, the laser lens there with a bit of IPA on a cotton bud uh, and then just dry it, leave it for a few minutes just to make sure it evaporates. So we cleaned off that horrible uh, black mark there that indicated that uh, someone had tested it and it was faulty. Um, I figure why not mark it according to how we feel today. So hopefully you'll agree that that looks absolutely brand spanking new. It looks absolutely immaculate. Fantastic. Looking absolutely sweet and uh, working perfectly. So I cleaned up the interface unit there as well. Um, and in terms of you know repairing one of these, the only thing that's in there, as far as I know, is you know it's obviously some passive connectivity. There may well be a chip that links the two, so you can have a fault there. But I think the 64k of RAM on board this interface unit so that's a possible cause for faults on one of these um, they're very difficult to get into the screws are easy to get out underneath you can see they just use the N64 Super Nintendo PC Engine Mega Drive carts game bit size it's the same size as all those systems uh, I think there's seven of those and then there's two uh, Philips so you know whatever they are the Japanese standard of crosshead uh, screws there easy to get those out but then uh, I did have a go at this and it's clipped it's clipped all the way around there's like three three clips down this side three clips down this side uh, here and you've got to literally you know prise the thing apart you know the plastic's pretty brittle you could break it so I don't want to risk it on this just to show you the PCB in there with what probably is just a single chip and well two chips let's say an interface chip to link the two and uh, a RAM chip probably so thanks for watching and I'll see you soon. Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. As you can see, this time we're looking at uh, PC Engine Super CD. God, no, we're not. 